Um, so good morning everybody and welcome to our third edition of the RIPE NCC EDUCA. Uh, my name is Rumi Spretlikanis, I manage the training department. Um, about a year ago we came up with the idea um, of organizing full day online events around specific topics of interest to our community. Um, we thought that events like this would be a great opportunity um, to dive into a specific topic and gather experts uh, in their fields uh, without having to travel and having people attend these presentations. So our first edition uh, was about RIPE Atlas, uh, took place in October last year and was such a success that we decided to uh, repeat these events. So in April we did the Routing Educa and here we are at our third Educa. How exciting. Thank you all for being here. Um, so, as you may know, exactly six years ago today uh, was the IPv6 World Day. So today uh, we want to look back and into the future. Where are we now? What is the status? Where are we going? What are the current challenges and milestones? So we have managed to gather experts from the industry to contribute to today's show. Um, and we found many interesting experienced speakers to uh, share their experiences with IPv6. So uh, some of the speakers we have, we have Bob Hinden and Fred Baker, both chairs of various working groups at the ITF. Um, we have Sylvia Hagen and Eric Finke, uh, both well-known names in the IPv6 world. Then we also have regular contributors to the ITF and the RIPE community, such as Jen Linkova, uh, who is also the co-chair of the IPv6 working group, Jordi Palette and Tim Chown. Um, apart from that, we have uh, various speakers who have implemented IPv6 in their organizations and are here to share their success stories and uh, uh, challenges along their way. From various sectors, we have telcos, hosting companies, uh, financial institutions, governmental um, consultants. So I would like to thank all the speakers who have made time in their busy schedules to join us for today's event. And of course, I also would like to uh, thank all the participants here um, who uh, show their interest in, in this. Now, before I show you uh, today's agenda and I, I start today's session, I want to take some time to explain the interface to you. So we have the main screen, which is where you will see the slides and any presentation materials we have. Then uh, in the bottom left side of your screen, you have a chat window. If you have any questions or comments, please type them there. Don't wait for your questions. You can type them in as soon as they pop up in your head so that we can prepare an answer or maybe even a discussion in the chat field. Then on the right side, um, you can see a give us feedback uh, window. Um, we love feedback. We're always looking for ways to improve our services uh, for you. So if you have any feedback, please let us know. But also please take some time to fill in the survey so we know how we can improve uh, this in the future. And then in the right bottom side, uh, in the download me box, will be all the materials uh, and all the slide decks uh, will be uploaded, uh, uploaded there uh, throughout the day. Um, also, what I wanted to mention to you is um, please bear with us if there's any technical issues. Obviously, this is an online event. Sometimes things go wrong or there may be a bit of a silence when we switch speakers between two windows. So when that happens, please don't leave us. Stick around and be a little bit patient um, because obviously some technical issues are out of our control. Um, also, all sessions will be recorded and made available afterwards. So if you miss a session or you can't really hear us, please don't panic. Um, you have lots of time later to look back on them. So now that we have the interface out of the way, let's get started. Today's agenda um, is in the main screen. We start with the introduction to uh, the RIPE NCC Educa, which is this session. Then after this session, we have uh, IPv6 right now, an eye on the status. Then we have a break. Um, we have uh, a session about current discussions on IPv6, then another break, and then um, IPv6 implementations. And finally, next steps, the road ahead, which is kind of a look into the future. So this specific session is introduction to the RIPE NCC. Um, we have two speakers in this session. First, we have uh, Bob Hinden. 
he's going to present on the past, present, and future of uh, the RIPEN of of IPv6, it's RIPEN CC. <laughs> and then after that, we have uh, Nicolas Pediaditis from the Registration Services Department, who will give us a view on IPv6 and where we stand as RIPEN CC in this. Um, so, uh, without much further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Bob Hinden, uh, who will take care of the first presentation. Please uh, give us some time while we switch speakers and uh, Bob comes online. Um, and we'll be back with you shortly. Um, let me see, is he here? Yes. Uh, what I also wanted to mention while we are there um, is don't hesitate to have discussions in the chat window if you have questions or if you see someone ask a question that you know the answer to, feel free to jump in. Um, hi, Bob. Nice to see you and thank you for joining us from all the way from uh, the other side of the world. I hear it's midnight for you or even later. Uh, so it's good you're not in your pajamas. Right. Uh, let me see if I can get that um, going. Let's see. No. Let me see. Um, I don't think we can hear Bob right now. Mm -hmm. It's working. Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, Bob, if you could enable your microphone, it's the, it's okay. Okay, then I'll uh, hand over to Bob. Thank you. Okay, you can hear me okay now. Good. Okay, let me see if I can share. Mm -hmm. So it's not allowing me to share PowerPoint. Try and share my screen. Oh, here we go. Applications. No. Okay. Yeah, I'm having trouble getting it. Oh, here we go. Okay. Is that working? Good. I'll start. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, when I accepted, I was originally planning to be uh, on your side of the world, but uh, the trip got changed, so I, I'm, I'm here in uh, California. Um, so um, I'm going to talk today about 
you know, IPv6, what I call past, present, and future, sort of how we developed IPv6 uh, or why, um, where we are now, and where I think, what I think are the next steps. Um, let's see. There we go. Um, and, yeah, so I've been involved in this um, since, I guess, before the beginning. Um, as I'll talk about later, it's, uh, I wonder some days if we knew how hard and long this was going to be, whether anyone would have actually worked on it. But we, we, we didn't know that, so we just did it. Um, so in the early 1990s, um, it was not clear that, you know, what we now call the Internet, TCP IP, was going to be successful. Um, it was not at all um, the common thing. Um, there were many competitors at the time. There was the OSI protocols. There was ATM. AT&T announced the business internet, um, and, and no one took what you know we now call the internet TCP/IP took it seriously. You know, it wasn't an official standard organization. Uh, it was a bunch of engineers that had support from. The certain parts of the U.S. government and, and some um, research groups, but the other parts of even the U.S. government and European governments were all behind the OSI protocols. Um, and also at the time, you know, people could start to see that IPv4 was going to, you know, run out of addresses. And so not having a plan for what came after IPv4 was actually a real issue for whether people wanted to invest in, you know, TCP IP. And I, you know, when I made this presentation, I went back and found some old slides, you know, from several, a number of jobs ago. Whoops. There we go. Um, and I, you know, I found two slides, which I, in some ways are timeless. This one, you know, we were seeing, you know, exponential internet growth then. Uh, it hasn't changed a lot. It's, it's probably good I didn't put any numbers on the axis. But, um, you know, we were seeing the same kind of problems in the 90s, 1990s as, you know, we see through today. Um, and, you know, and this was my view of what was causing the growth. <clears throat> and I think it turned out to be pretty correct. Um, you know, we were seeing more of, you know, having all computers on the internet. We were just thinking about having commerce and advertising. I mean, I don't think we had any idea what was going to happen, actually, um, in the way it did happen, but it certainly did. We were seeing new kinds of users. Um, you know, large countries were joining new industries were joining, and this was before, you know. So, uh, as you may have noticed, uh, we had a little problem here, um, and uh, uh, Bob was frozen. So, we're going to try to see if we can get the connection with him back up, but um, we thought it'd be better to just move on to the next speaker while, uh, while we sort the problems with him. So, um, I would like to introduce you to Nicolas Pediaditis. He is from the Registration Services Department and will give you an overview of um, the RIPE NCC status with IPv6. Um, so, without much further ado, thank you, Nicolas. The word is yours. Hello, all. Uh, this is Nicolas from Registration Services. Uh, could you please confirm whether you can hear me? Excellent. I will just take 10 seconds of your time to share my screen. Hopefully everything will work out. Okay. Excellent. Uh, this is uh, this will be um, a rather uh, brief uh, presentation, um, just to give you a very high-level idea on um, uh, the status of IPv6 from the point of view of registration services with the RIP, within the RIPE NCC, and a couple of numbers and a couple of uh, news that might be of interest to you. 
um, we will start with some numbers. And the reason I am starting like this on a global on a global level is because, well, as being part of one of the um, customer facing departments of the RIPNCC, uh, we have the privilege of uh, being uh, in contact with um, our members and the RIP community on a daily basis. So we have the privilege of being able to observe trends, uh, concerns, questions. And I assume it, is, it will not be a surprise for anybody that uh, one of the main questions when people start thinking about IPv6 is um, how much do we have? Uh, are we wasting it? Uh, are we being too conservative? Uh, what should be our priority? And as RIPNCC, uh, we keep saying that, OK, um, guys, we have enough. Uh, prioritize your good planning for the future. Um, there is no, uh, the goal of conser conservation is not that important anymore. But at the same time, uh, we don't mean waste it. We don't mean let's repeat all the uh, mistakes that we did for IPv4 in the past. Um, so let's illustrate this for, with uh, a couple of graphs and a few numbers. Uh, in this slide, uh, you see the global IPv6 address distribution. So the gray circle, you can imagine as all IPv6 space there is, a slash zero. And to begin with, the Internet Architecture Board uh, have split this in eight parts, and a slash, th uh, and a slash three, so one-eighth, has been given to IANA. In case anybody is not familiar with IANA, is the organization that acts as the global repository for all Internet number resources. And it's the uh, organization that distributes resources to us, to the RIRs, like the RIPNCC in our case. Uh, so the yellow circle represents what IANA has in its pool, uh, in its pools to distribute further to the five RIRs worldwide. And as you can see, each RIR in 2016 received one slash 12. Uh, the last one is what the RIPNCC reserve, um, uh, received from IANA. And if you have received an allocation from the RIPNCC, highly likely it's from that prefix. And all those slash 12s um, represent this very little thin blue line that you see within the yellow circle. So even if we, all of the RIRs, we distribute all the IPv6 space we have in our pools and we go back to IANA for more, then all we have done is to burn uh, through that blue line. And we still have the yellow circle to go. What I'm trying to say is that we have enough. Uh, it's uh, really important to try to switch our mindsets um, and get out of the era where uh, conservation was uh, really important and every IP address counts and we need to save as much as possible and move into the era of really well planning uh, for our networks for the future uh, for potential growth for uh, our customers. In a global picture, um, in terms of uh, IPv6 uh, space uh, that all the RIRs have uh, allocated over time, uh, you can see numbers in terms of slash 32s, what each RIR has been uh, given out um, in total. And as you can see, the RIPNCC is by far uh, to the second the RIR with the most uh, distributed allocations uh, worldwide. Of course, there are reasons for this, and partially is because of uh, the way our policies are shaped. Uh, but uh, in that respect, respect we have been um, given out almost double uh, compared to, for example, to EPNIC, uh, that is the second um, in terms of numbers. In terms of distributing um, IPv6 addresses uh, to our service region alone, uh, the RIPNCC right now has uh, approximately 19,000 uh, members. And out of those, uh, 13,000 and a half are actually holding IPv6 space. Uh, and that would be either an IPv6 allocation, so the big block uh, that we give to our members, and from that block they can distribute it further, uh, further to their infrastructure or to their customers, or there might be even some IPv6 PI assignments. But in total, uh, 71 of all of our members hold IPv6 somehow. And if you uh, then go further, looking uh, a bit into routing and announcements, and I'm pretty sure that the presentations that will follow uh, will uh, give you much better insight on this. But it's really um, also important to notice how uh, much IPv6 space 
is actually being seen, uh, is actually visible in BGP. So the percentage of uh, AS numbers, AS is autonomous systems, that announce one or more IPv6 prefixes right now that we can see is 26%. An interesting graph that can show you uh, the relationship between our membership um, and the LIRs, the LIR accounts that our members run, uh, and how many have IPv6 and how many don't. So the blue line in this graph uh, represents um, the LIRs uh, with IPv6, and the uh, red one is the ones without IPv6. Interesting to notice is the moment where those graphs, uh, those lines started changing. And for example, you will notice that a key moment was 2012. The reason being is that that was the year that we announced that we are pretty much running out of IPv4. Uh, in 2011, IANA uh, announced that I am out uh, IPv4. I, I have distributed all of my IPv4 to the RIRs. In 2012, the RIPNCC reached the final slash 8 in its pools. And that's the moment that you see uh, the uh, blue line really picking up. At the same time, you will observe that the red line is doing a curve, which means that basically the LIRs uh, without IPv6 are increasing. And you might think that this is weird. Uh, it is, uh, however, uh, there is a very reasonable explanation for this, uh, one being the change in our policies. It used to be the case that in order to get IPv4 from the ripe NCC, you should have IPv6 first. Uh, but that policy changed around 2015, so this is not the case anymore. And at the same time, we have the phenomenon of um, organization opening uh, multiple LIRs in order to acquire more IPv4, and those LIRs stay without IPv6. So it's perfectly reasonable why we see um, the line growing for LIRs without IPv6, although IPv6 is actually picking up and uh, we see increased um, deployments. Um, also, in terms of historical distribution from the RIPE NCC, um, I am only focus focusing on IPv6 allocations in the graphs, mainly because um, in terms of numbers of IP addresses, uh, when we talk about PI assignments, even if we combine all together, uh, they add up to such a small number that they don't make any difference. Uh, so in this graph, you can see uh, the change in how many IPv6 allocation, allocations that RIPE NCC is issuing over time since the first moment we did that in 1999. And you can actually see uh, the same uh, result as the previous graph. So as of 2011, 2012, things have started stabilizing. And we have a constant growth year by year uh, for on the number of LIRs that are actually getting IPv6 allocations. So as RIPE NCC, uh, one of the main things we do is to distribute uh, IP addresses and AS numbers, and of course IPv6. And all that, the rules uh, based on which we do that and we act, uh, comes from uh, RIPE policies. The policies that you guys as the RIPE community get to decide. Uh, quickly, uh, in case somebody is not familiar with this, um, the, main, the very main points from the IPv6 policy is that uh, a minimum allocation that an LIR can get from us uh, is a slash 32, and any LIR can get up to a slash 29 without ask, asking any questions other than uh, you confirming that you have a plan to deploy IPv6 in the coming two years. Uh, there has been a very important change in the uh, IPv6 uh, policy. Um, this happened uh, almost two years ago. And it was uh, driven, uh, among others, by the German government. Uh, due to the uh, big increase in uh, demand for large IPv6 allocations, uh, the policy had to be adjusted in order to allow organizations uh, to facilitate uh, their uh, process of requesting large IPv6 allocations from the RIPE NCC. Until then, we would only consider the uh, number of customers and the extent of the infrastructure. Uh, in order to evaluate a request, after this policy change, uh, additional uh, bits uh, will be considered uh, based on assessment criteria like a hierarchical and geographical uh, structure, plank longevity, uh, security levels of an organization, and so on. Important thing to remember, especially for IPv6, uh, being uh, with so many IP addresses, uh, is that every assignment must be registered in the right database. 
and this as IPv6 is picking up will be more and more important uh, in the future for network operators. Finally, you don't need to be a member of the RepNCC to have IPv6. Uh, you can be uh, an end user uh, and if your need is small, uh, you can get a PI, a PI assignment as we call it uh, from the RepNCC with a minimum size from that one being a slash 48. Uh, quickly, a couple of recent updates in terms of uh, the IPv6 uh, policy. Uh, there has been an IPv6 sub-assignment clarification. If you are one of those that have uh, a PI assignment from the RIPNCC, uh, so if your need is for a small block, it used to be the case that you could not use a single IP address from that IP block for a customer of yours. So if you wanted to run a Wi-Fi service, that wouldn't be possible. With this new policy update, this is now possible and the provision of separate addresses to customer, customers is not considered a sub-assignment anymore. Uh, and a final update in terms of uh, RIPE policy, this is coming up, it's almost there. Uh, it's the clarification uh, and the thing that changed is now the right to receive IPv6 allocations will apply per LIR. Any LIR is entitled for at least one initial IPv6 allocation. And this is the um, uh, as I come to uh, the end of this presentation, this is actually the most important bit uh, because it contains the message that we want to give you guys. Um, being in contact uh, continuously uh, with our members and, and uh, the RIPE community, we uh, can observe some trends and we can report some observations uh, back to you. Um, and most of them, we must say, are quite positive when it comes to IPv6. Um, we keep hearing feedback, um, especially through our training services department that is traveling uh, and is continuously in contact uh, with you, uh, delivering extensive IPv6 trainings. And a common feedback, for example, that we hear is that, um, you know what, the big players are not doing it. Uh, Nobody is uh, yet serious about IPv6. And we are in the nice position to be able to see that it's actually the opposite that is happening. Uh, because we see people seriously planning on IPv6 for the near future. And we can see this because they actually come to us to, to get their IPv6 addresses. Uh, so we have seen a very big uh, increase in terms of interest for large IPv6 allocations. Uh, so it means that all the big players, the ISPs, the telcos, governments uh, are actually planning big in IPv6. So a slash 29, the minimum that we give, the default that we give, let's say, uh, is not big enough for them. So uh, we see um, a big interest, an increase in that interest of receiving larger IPv6 allocations. Uh, the governments uh, have become more active. Uh, we see uh, them preparing nationwide plans. Uh, and this is really positive uh, because it's really evident that they have taken this thing very seriously. Uh, of course, organizations are planning ahead, and that's a positive message, but at the same time, we can see that the scars, if I can call them that, of IPv4 are still there. Um, people are still a bit conservative when it comes to addressing plans, to planning ahead. Um, there is still the mindset of, um, uh, do I, will I have issues with security? Do I need to just keep nothing? Things like that. It's not easy to change uh, this mentality. So the scars of IPv4 are still there, but we see that it's actually changing quite rapidly lately. Um, the knowledge around IPv6 is still limited, and this is why uh, the RIPNCC is increasing uh, the efforts uh, in terms of uh, raising awareness in IPv6, uh, our training services department again being uh, the flagship in that. Uh, one thing that we have also observed and we're trying to raise awareness is the regist that registration when it comes to registering what uh, you guys are actually using when it comes to IPv6 can be a puzzle. Uh, the number of IP addresses in IPv6 is massive, uh, and by IP address I mainly mean subnets, uh, and it's, we can see that it's still not very clear to everyone how this should be done. However, everybody agrees that uh, registration is a very important goal, especially when it comes to security or especially when it comes to facilitating the work of network operators to communicate with each other. Um, so we are also increasing, increasing our efforts in that, uh, in that regard. 
At the same time, uh, we also see, uh, and that is actually connected to the scars of IPv4 being there, we also see an effort uh, from some organizations, a minority, uh, not a majority, to actually stockpile IPv6, either because uh, they are hurt from running out of IPv4 and it's like, okay, uh, now we can do it, so why not get a bit more and uh, see if we can use it in the future or because of future plans to distribute it to their customers or to secure the future of their customers. But we do see efforts of uh, stockpiling IPv6. And finally, um, how would we promote IPv6 as a registration services? Um, well, we evaluate IPv6 requests on a daily basis. And because some of them uh, involve uh, very complicated uh, network plans uh, and uh, topologies and uh, discussions. We have actually created a specialized IPv6 team within the registration services department. Every internet resource analyst is capable of dealing with these requests, but we have uh, on top of that created a specialized group that is always uh, on the edge, uh, being trained, uh, following technology, and uh, being responsible to uh, make sure that everybody is on the same level and aware. Uh, at the same time, we're trying to advise people when they're actually requesting IPv4 or when they're asking us about IPv4. Can I get more? Uh, what are the ways to get more? I'm having problems. What can I do? Uh, then that's a moment to sticking some advice uh, about IPv6 and the importance of start planning and testing and deploying. Uh, we're trying to increase our presence in uh, conferences and events. Uh, we're trying to raise awareness when it comes to IPv6 uh, because it's not a secret anymore. Uh, we can see problems coming and the more we can make people aware on that it, it's actually, um, um, it will be too late if we don't start now. Uh, and that we can do by uh, actually delivering some presentations. Uh, and finally, um, I spoke earlier about the increasing demand from uh, governments when it comes to deploying uh, and creating uh, nationwide plans with IPv6. Uh, we saw this demand uh, and we, we saw a bit of a, a gap when it comes to knowledge. Uh, so recently we created an IPv6 uh, for governments program. Uh, this is not training, this is not uh, uh, technical. Uh, we have extensive IPv6 training courses uh, delivered uh, by training services department uh, if you want to receive training. Uh, this is uh, something that comes before that when it comes to government, trying to facilitate them uh, before requesting uh, IPv6 space from us. Trying to make them understand how they can uh, uh, do their planning uh, and what, the, for example, uh, justification they will need to provide in order to facilitate what they are actually trying to do. So if any of the participants um, is interested in working for a government, uh, make your colleagues aware that this is available for you. We actually travel, arrange meetings in your country, and deliver a full day program uh, to try to help you with your planning. That will be all for me. Uh, I don't want to take any more of your time. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank, Thank you very much, Nicolas. Very interesting. Um, and uh, really nice to hear that there is a positive trend uh, with regards to the uptake of IPv6. Are there any questions or comments for Nicolas? I don't see any, so thank you very much, Nicolas. Um, then we are going to try to uh, reconnect with Bob. Uh, we're going to try to have him done, do his presentation without video, so just the voice and his slides, and hopefully um, we'll have less uh, issues with uh, bandwidth connection. So bear with us while we uh, restart, Bob, and I'll be back with you if uh, we have any problems with that. So, uh, Bob, the floor is yours. Oh, there is one uh, last question. Um, if IPv6, if IPv4 allocated as slash 32, what is the process to enlarge it to a slash 29? Actually, is, if IPv6 yeah. is allocated, allocated, what is the process? It's the, simple, uh, the simplest process on Earth. Uh, you just need to drop us an email and ask for it, and we will do it immediately. There is absolutely nothing that you need to uh, 
send us in terms of justification. Uh, you just tell us, I want my slice 32 to become a slice 29, and we will do it for you. The only exceptions uh, will be uh, LIRs that received uh, IPv6 blocks in the very beginning. Those, uh, since they are very old, uh, different times might not be able to be extended, but we can always give you a fresh slash 29 in any case. Does that uh, answer your question, Martin? Yes. Great. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Nicolas. Um, and now uh, the floor is to Bob. Let's see if it works. Good. Can you hear me? Yes, Bob, we can hear you loud and clear. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, last time I was I ended up just talking to myself, apparently. Um, so I, I will start again. So I, I will give you an overview of how we got to IPv6, where I think it is now, and what the future is. So in the early 1990s, it was not clear that TCP IP was going to be successful. There were, there were many alternate choices, many competitors. No one took the, you know, the community of people that was building TCP IP seriously. It wasn't an official standards organization. You know, it wasn't, um, governments didn't accept it. Even parts of the U.S. government didn't accept it. There were competitors, the OSI CLNP, the OSI Connectionless Network Protocols, ATM, AT&T was going to create a business internet. Um, there were predictions of internet meltdowns. Bob Metcalf, who invented Ethernet, um, was the, the, I think, best known of this. He basically pronounced that if the internet didn't melt down in the next year, he would eat his hat. And he, a year later, he did eat his hat. Um, he tried to eat it, make a cake, but I think they made him eat a real, a real hat. So uh, we got through that. Um, but one of the other issues relating to this was not having a plan for what followed IPv4 was a real issue. Um, and so, you know, it was even then, it was important that we did have a plan we could point to for something to replace V4. Um, you know, I found some old slides that, um, you know, from this time period around 1995 when I was working for Ypsilon Networks. We were talking about exponential growth of the internet then. Um, it's good that I didn't put numbers on the axis here, um, but um, you know we were seeing, even though the numbers were much smaller then, we were seeing lots of growth, and we were also thinking about what was causing the growth, and you know, and I think we were, you know, largely correct about, you know, what what was going to happen. You know, we were saying that all computers were going to be on the internet. And this was not something that was at all clear then. We were going to see real commerce, and we were going to see advertising to pay for it. Um, again, these were not accepted ideas. Uh, we, we were seeing, projecting that there were going to be large classes of new users on the internet, um, both um, you know new countries coming on, China, India, um, new industries, you know, cable modems, mobile phones. I mean, at that time, you didn't have a mobile phone that had the internet in it. Um, you know, it was just voice. And mobile phones were still pretty clunky back then. Uh, and we had the notion that everything would be network. You know, everything was going to be on the internet. You know, sort of what, what we now call the internet of things. And so we, we were seeing this is what was going to happen, and this was what sort of led to the thinking of what was necessary. So the timeline for this work in the ITF um, was in the early 1990s. You know, as I said, the Internet was growing exponentially, and it looked like we were running out of what we called Class B addresses. IPv4 addresses at the time were grouped in classes. You know, there was A, B, and C. Uh, well, there's still D and E um, today, but Class B were very popular because they had a reasonable size, reasonable number of networks, and a reasonable so number of devices you could have on that network. Um, 
So the ITF formed a group called Routing and Addressing, or the Road Group. Um, this met a number of times and came up with two recommendations. One, to implement, implement CIDR, Classless Interdomain Routing, and develop the next generation of IP. We called it IPNG at the time. Um, and then the year later, something interesting happened. The Internet Architecture Board, the IAB, um, decided um, that it knew what was best and um, came out with its IP version 7 pronouncement. Um, this later became known as the Kobe incident in that basically the, it was sort of a revolution in the I, internet ITF community is that we didn't want to just do what the IEB said and we also disagreed with it. And so the result of this was that the IEB used to be the final step in creating standards and that was taken away from the IEB and it was moved exclusively to the IESG. Uh, and that's the structure we have today. And so th this was the case of the Internet Architecture Board really overstepping and not listening to the, the community. Um, so the ITF later that year did a formal call for proposals for, um, for an IP next generation proposals. Um, and the ISG took on this responsibility. They formed an area you know, like they have transport and internet and routing, they formed an IP next generation area. Scott Bradner and Allison Mankin were the directors. Um, and they issued an RFC, which uh, called for proposals. And importantly, it defined the requirements for a next generation protocol. And then a year later, uh, there was a recommendation. So the there were a number of candidates, and these evolved in different ways. Um, there was another IP version 7. Um, uh, I'll talk more about these later. There was, um, or I have separate slides. There was one called Tuba, which was based on the CLNP protocols. And then there was a series of protocols um, or efforts, one called NCAPS, which was about encapsulation that I proposed, and then that merged in something called IPay, and then Steve Deering developed Simple IP, Paul Francis developed a protocol called PIP, and those all merged into one called Simple IP Plus, and this became the basis for IPv6. So that there were a number of competing efforts. They all wrote documents. There were lots of presentations. Uh, there was lots of activity from, you know, 92 to um, 95, 94, 95. So the, you might wonder what the, you know, where these names came from and what the versions are. Um, so, you know, IP version 4 had a 4-bit version field. Um, and so 4 was assigned to IP. You know, currently we call it IPv4. Um, there was another protocol called um, the Streams Protocol, but it was not an internet protocol. It was something that ran in parallel. It did real-time audio and video. Uh, that had already was assigned five. Um, and then, then the next set of numbers were given to the different proposals. So SIP, and, which became IPv6, got six, and IP version seven, you know, catnip became seven. Uh, PIP of uh, 8 and TUBA 9, and 10 through 15 are uh, unassigned. Um, and I, I note with some humor that um, at some point in this process, someone proposed IP version 16, not quite thinking that having a bigger number was better, but not realizing that the um, version number doesn't support the number 16. You can only go through 0 through 15. So I didn't take that very seriously. So I will go through each of these a bit. Um, I'm sure you know what classless interdomain routing is, but at the time it was new and we didn't do it that way. Um, routing at the time was, you know, based on fixed boundaries in the addresses and the allocation um, 
strategy was flat. There was no aggregation. Um, and then each of these network, you know, the network part was advertised. And so it, um, so its scaling properties were fairly limited. Um, and Insider allowed you to allocate blocks of addresses to providers instead of indi to individual users. Uh, we now call these prefixes. And the routing protocols were changed to allow aggregation of the routes to a single provider. Um, this was something that didn't happen before and was obviously causing the routing protocols to not scale well. Um, CIDR, um, so CIDR made the address utilization much more efficient and improved route scaling. So it, it, it was a very important thing to do. So CATNIP, um, you know, was the first one on the chart. It was called Common Architecture for Next Generation Internet Protocol. Um, that Vladimir Skunik was the author and chair. Um, it's documented in RFC 1707. Um, you know, it's based on the work of the TPIX working group. And, and this was sort of leveraged, trying to leverage the common ground between the OSI and the Novell protocols. Uh, which you don't hear about much anymore, but were very popular then, um, to, to make, so basically to make the Nobel protocols into a, a, a global internet protocol. It was very useful for local networking. Um, it, it, my memory of this is it wasn't very specif well specified, it had interesting ideas, but wasn't actually a complete proposal. Um, Tuba was basically the idea of using TCP, UDP over bigger addresses, which really meant the ISO connectionless network protocol. Sim basically, the idea that the what the IAB proposed or, or told us we were going to do, but um, the ITEP does not like to be told what to do. You may have noticed this yourself. Um, and the approach was to run TCP. UDP over over the ISO connectionless network protocol. It basically leveraged the protocol work that had been done in ISO and the implementations. And if I was to summarize this, I think this the strength was that it it had an existing protocol, but it was also a weakness because there was a great reluctance by the CLNP community to want to change, and there were reasons to change and. I still, in some ways, think had they been the people doing this had been more open to accepting changes and give the ITEP change control, we might be running this today. But they didn't then, so it didn't happen. Um, SIP is was called Simple IP. It's different than the thing we use for voice and video today. Um, the original SIP. Um, it's Steve Deering is the author and architect of this, and you can still find an internet draft that describes it. Uh, I found the link today. Um, and it had 64-bit um, addresses, twice the number of bits of IPv4, but it kept the header size at the same size as IPv4, 20 bytes. So I always thought this was actually a very nice design because it kept the overhead the same, but greatly increased the address size. So it, I thought it was a very clean and elegant design. Um, but the questions were, you know, were 64 bits enough? Um, and I also think in hindsight, this probably would have been the easiest protocol to transition to because it was a, some ways a very incremental change on IPv4. You know, address allocation was done, would have been done exactly the same way. There were less new things in a lot of ways. It had certain ways of extending, but it, it uh, yeah. But you know, the ITEP is a committee, and um, compromises had to be reached. So SIP um, was sort of a combined protocol that sort of combined the work I had done, Paul Francis had done, and Steve had done. Um, you know, it's based on the merger of NCAPS into IPA with SIP and PIP. It's a lot of acronyms. Um, but it, you know, it, um, you know, it was designed to take the features of all of them. Um, you know, it inherited the clean design of SIP, but the 
thinking was the addresses were too small and the extended addressing that was proposed in 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 the SIP with 2P protocol um, was deemed to be too complicated. Um, and so towards the end of this process, the the big debate was basically about address address size. Um, and it came down to you know two things. So basically a fixed length 64-bit address address from SIP. You know, it met the requirements by three orders of magnitude. You know, it's support lots of nodes at very um, low, very high, low allocation rates. Um, it minimized the growth of the packet. It was very efficient for software processing. It was a, you know, 64 bits is of multiple, fits into the word size of machines then and today. Um, the alternative was variable length addressing. You know, it was essentially looking at the 160-bit addresses from CLNP or from the Tuba proposal. Uh, it was compatible with the OSI NSAP addresses. Um, it was large enough for auto configuration using, like, you know, IEEE MAC addresses. This has proven to be, uh, I mean, that's certainly true, but I think we just learned a lot about some privacy issues of doing that in the last number of years. Um, and the claim was made you could start with shorter addresses and grow later. Unfortunately, there wasn't any example of actually doing that. And even and use in the CLNP deployment at the time, also, you know, they while they could have had smaller addresses and grown, they just made them 160 bits long, which was a very cumbersome address. So, so they weren't actually using them as variable length addresses. So the the group doing this basically com compromised on a fixed 128-bit address. So it made the SIP addresses twice as big, or twice the number of bits, and but kept them fixed length. And and that's what was adopted in 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 what became IPv6. So the IPNG recommendation from the working group was to go with SIP with 128-bit addresses. The an IP NG working group was created to create the specification and standardize IPv6. Um, the initial chairs were Steve Deering and Ross Callan. Ross had co-chaired co the Tuba working group, and I was appointed document editor. Um, later, Ross um, stopped doing that, and I, I became the co-chair with Steve. Um, and the goals were to resolve the remaining issues, complete unfinished work, and move to proposed standard. And this was done in December 1995. RFC 1883 was published. So that's the first specification of IPv6. So the good news was we did finally run out of IP before addresses. It did happen. It took a long time. It took I think much longer than we had expected it would take. It looked like it was going to happen soon, but you know, I think the combination of CIDR, which made the addresses allocation more efficient, and the addition of network address translation sort of really pushed out the lifetime of V4. Um, yeah. And um, I, I think it was a surprise to most people involved. But, but we were right about that. It just took longer than we expected. Um, and today we're seeing, you know, very high usage of IPv6. You know, I looked, I looked at these today, and uh, Google, Google is seeing about 24% of their total access to Google is with IPv6. And they don't know they don't release how much traffic this is or how many nodes are talking to them. Yeah, so I don't know what 24% of what, but I suspect given the amount of traffic Google represents on the internet, this is a really big number. So, you know, we're seeing, um, you know, that we're seeing pretty much exponential growth and it's been going on um, since, um, you know, 2011, 2012, and it doesn't look like it's stopping. It's also interesting. If you notice the beginning of these, the beginning of every year, it seems to level off, and then it picks up again. And, um, 
I was sort of wondering the beginning of this year whether it had stopped growing, but you know, a few months later it started to grow again. So, um, you know, we're all so basically almost a quarter of Google's traffic is now IPv6, and, and that's a lot. Um, it's just some stats I pulled from Akamai's site. I have a slide for ISP status. So these are the ISPs with the highest percentage of IPv6. And, you know, so Verizon, AT&T, Comcast, et cetera, are, are, you know, have, this is, this is what Akamai is seeing, but they're seeing very high percentages of V6 traffic from these uh, ISPs. And they also, you know, these are the countries with the, you know, this is the percentage of uh, IPv6 from these countries that Akamai is seeing, and Belgium is the top of the list, um, USA, India, Greece, Germany, Luxembourg, Switzerland, Finland, um, you know, all have very high percentages. So, I mean, I think it's fairly interesting that, um, well, let's just take USA and India. So this is a fair, this transition is fairly far along if Akamai is seeing you know, around 40% of traffic, you know, that gets to Akamai for the sites they service from the USA and from India. Uh, I think this is, uh, we've come a long way with IPv6. We're not, you know, this is not 100%, but we are making real progress. So another recent bit of news is the ITF published IPv6 as an internet standard. Uh, before that, it was proposed and draft standard. Um, this happened last July. Um, internet standard is the last step in the ITF standards process. And it was now published as RFC 8200. Um, and um, so I, I think this is, I mean, this is a big step in the ITF. It's lots of hurdles to get there. Um, but it, it's a sign that the IETF is saying that it's very stable and there, are, there aren't going to be any significant incompatible changes going forward. So if anyone was worried about that, you no longer have to worry about it. So IPv6 state today um, is very good. Um, you know, I think all major platforms support it, Mac OS, Windows, Linux, Android, iOS, this is the big fixed and mobile operating systems. It's supported, well supported on routers, switches, firewalls, other security devices. Um, you know, major content providers support IPv6, Google, Netflix, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube. You know, all, all the, these sites account for probably more than half of all the traffic on the internet. Um, large ISPs support IPv6. Um, CDNs have proved to be a very nice way of getting IPv6 access to IPv4 only sites because they basically front. So you can re go get to the site via a CDN with IPv6 and it just serves up the content. It doesn't you know, care what's behind it. Um, Amazon Web Services now supports IPv6. It's been a little slow getting the, the other sort of cloud computing service to, to do this, but it is coming along. And, to, and this is, I think, newer. Some large enterprises are starting to work on IPv6 only. But, um, that's not, that, I think that's the beginning of the next phase in the transition, but it's, um, you know, I think interesting nonetheless. So um, I think there are, gonna, there are a number of challenges going forward. Um, lots of what I call mid-sized sites, banks, commerce, finance, um, just lots of websites don't support IPv6. Um, you know, I don't completely understand because it's not that hard anymore, but I guess, they, well, I don't, it's something I think we need to understand better. Um, and enterprises are mostly IPv4 today. They may they they may have their public, you know, website 
being IPv6, but inside they're almost all IPv4. It's still very, even having dual stack is, is fairly rare. Small, some smaller ISPs don't do it. Um, I, I'm sort of surprised that I, a lot of IoT devices don't do it out of the box. I thought that was going to be a big area where you need a lot of addresses, but it doesn't seem to have started that way. You know, and, and likely there are some new network products that still come with IPv4 only. Um, you know, they say it's on the roadmap, but they don't need it yet. I, um, I sort of, as a hobby, when I see a new interesting network product um, or an IoT device, I get on their support thing and I ask them, do you support IPv6? And try to encourage them. I had a little success getting people to do that. I now run, uh, so I don't mind giving them a commercial pitch. I, I now run Aero, E-E-R-O, uh, mesh wireless solution um, at home. And, you know, I worked with them, they encouraged them, and, you know, I was a beta site, and it works quite well, and I have very nice Wi-Fi at home. So, uh, and I think it's now supported by several other mesh wireless solutions, but, you know, they didn't do it when they first released their product. Not there quite yet. Uh, so we have come a long way, but there's still a lot more to do. We're not done, and I don't think it will just take care of itself. I think it's still something we need to work on. So my conclusions uh, with IPv6 are we were right about running out of IPv4 addresses, but we really didn't understand the impact of NAT, what was going to happen. I mean, NAT hadn't really taken off when we decided to do this. Um, we were not right about how long it would take to develop IPv6. We weren't right about, you know, when IPv4 addresses would run out and really how hard and long it was to deploy this. Um, it, it, I think, was much harder and fully took much more time than we would ever have imagined. Um, as I said, I sort of wonder if we had known what we were in what we were signing ourselves up to, whether we would have just run away and not worried about it, but we did. Um, but we made IPv6 happen by really building a community of motivated, dedicated people around the world. It, you know, it, Steve Daring and I were chairing the working group, and we realized pretty quickly that if we wanted this to be successful, the thing we needed to do was to get as many other people involved as we could and get them to believe in the idea and the need for this and have it become something they were going to run with. And I, and I think that approach worked very well. And I thank everyone who you know, listened to us and decided to help build this IPv6 community. Um, so we also, we did not, we clearly didn't anticipate how the internet would change. You know, when we were doing this, it was still, you know, a small, relatively small group of people, and you basically built it, and people would figure out how to use it. I mean, that was the way the internet started, you know, and it wasn't until the web was invented that, you know, the usage started to grow. There was no business model based on advertising at the beginning, you know, and so it evolved to be, there had to be a business case, and so people were trying to grow their commercial business and they didn't really want to deal with adding a new protocol. Um, I think it's also true that a lot of the industry was in denial about this for a very long time. You know, a lot of companies just decided, didn't think it was going to be necessary. It wasn't until they were seeing shortages of IPv4 addresses or it was getting more difficult to get that they finally realized they needed to do this. Um, and I also don't think anyone has done anything like this before. So we were, there was not a good model for how to do this. And so I also note about the internet, um, it, it's very hard to deploy anything today that requires global deployment before it's useful. Um, anything new needs immediate return and it has to solve a local problem before it can solve a global problem. I mean, I, I, there are two things, you know, I've worked on a lot of things in the ITF, but I, 
you know, you, you know about IPv6. But I also worked on a protocol called VIRP, Virtual Router Redundancy Protocol. And this, this sort of had just the op, this had the, the characteristics of if, if you had two routers and you wanted to make them back each other up, you implemented that and it solved, it solved a local problem for you. And so it, it was adopted very quickly. It got deployed, you know, anyone who needed it, lots of vendors did it. Uh, because it solved a local problem. It didn't require a whole bunch, everyone else to do it. You just needed to before it did something useful. And so, you know, if, the, if I compare the two things, IPv6 was just the opposite. It requ really required everyone to do it in scale before it was useful. I think we're now at that point, and, you know, what I'll say is, you know, IPv6 deployment really has become a local problem. It's, some people need to, you know, a lot of the, big deployments we're seeing now and they re people really need to ha you know they can't get before addresses anymore so it's a local problem for them and i think that's what's a lot of what's driven the growth we've seen in the last five or six years so uh thank you i'm happy to answer questions thank you very much bob um does anyone have any questions for bob um, I, while people are typing, I have a question actually. You you showed some slides with some of the learning points and the lessons learned. I'm happy you didn't run away, by the way, even if you wanted to. Um, if you could go back in time, is there anything you would change or do differently or you would recommend to do differently? Oh, um, yes, of course. I mean, there's probably lots of technical things we might do differently because they, you know, we understand things we didn't understand then. But, but I don't think it would have had any significant effect on how long or hard it was going to be to deploy IPv6. I think these are largely issues that, um, you know, that, well, I care about and other engineers care about. But I think the issues about, you know, what took so long were really independent of any technical decisions we made. Um, so I, I, yeah, I mean, I, you know, if I had to do it over again, I think I would have probably argued harder for just doing SIP, you know, the 64-bit addresses. It was a very simple design, and uh, I think that would have been a lot easier. But, you know, it was an I, the ITF. You know, they wanted to make, didn't want to do this twice. And so they wanted to make sure the addresses were bigger and having bigger addresses led to a lot of other things. And, you know, which made it probably made it harder. But um, it, in hindsight, I don't think it would have had any effect on the, uh, how hard, how, you know, the effort to actually deploy it in scale. Yeah, I agree. Thank you, Bob, very much. Um, then we've come to the end of our first section, which was the introduction to IPv6. Our next section is uh, about uh, IPv6 right now, uh, an eye on what the status is, um, which is moderated by my colleague Alvaro. And we have uh, as speakers um, Massimiliano Stucci, our IPv6 program manager. Uh, we have Eric Finke and Stephen Stroh speaking. So uh, we're going to be changing speakers in the next minute. It shouldn't take too long, but please don't run away. Bear with us while we uh, change speakers and set the room up for the next round. Um, thank you very much for your interest in the first session, and uh, I'll see you later. Enjoy the rest of the sessions.